You love Jesus? Come on, give him one more hand clap and pray. <laughs> Pastor Lisa, I love you. I love you. <laughs> Woman of God. I don't have no cash on me. I don't know why. <laughs> Praise the Lord, everybody. I'm sorry. Do I need to go up? Praise the Lord, everybody. <laughs> Hallelujah. We thank the Lord for this day and for this opportunity. This is my best friend, y'all. This is my best friend sometimes when we argue. We do argue. Uh, we do. And he is my white knight. Raise your hand, babe, so they can see. There you go. Right? I do. I call him my white knight. It's funny because I like to see people's face and their reaction when I say it. Right? Um, because clearly he's white. Right? So, um, and he is my knight. I just want people to understand, wow, I'm looking out here, y'all. This is what heaven looks like. Right? <laughs> this is what heaven looks like. All of these amazing colors, but I do that because I want people to understand that, um, you know, heroin doesn't see color. We do. Alcoholism doesn't see color. We do. Depression and anxiety and suicide, Pastor D doesn't see color. We do. So that's why I do it. The Lord has brought Rob and I together. We've been married 24 years. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And we have had to face some things from other people and what have you, but it has not stopped us. Um, before my dad went to heaven, he began to tell me Rob was raised Jehovah Witness. He only knew Jesus as being a teacher. Um, but I love Jesus. I'm a PK. I'm a preacher's kid. So Jesus was always a part of my life. When we met, I told Rob, I said, well, we would only have to be friends because I know Jesus and he's like my whole world and you don't. But my pop, my dad, Papa Brown, began to tell me, girl, God is using you to be his lighthouse. I said, but Papa, he doesn't know. He said, listen to what I'm saying. He said, God is using you to be Rob's lighthouse. Because when the ships are out there at sea, they need the light to be drawn into shore. He said, that's the only way they can get to safety. That's the only way they'll be able to survive. He said, the light that God has placed on the inside of you, it will draw Rob to the Lord. Now we have been together and ministering and he prays for me and he covers me, right? He is there for me. We touch and agree on some things. Now the Lord is using us to be the repairers of the breach. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So that people will see his glory, but not color. So I am grateful to the Lord today for my friend, for Pastor Chris, because I told him that we had some individuals in the ministry that desire to be baptized. And he said, sis, why don't you come on and do it with us? And I said, you so crazy. Like, who does that, right? I'm just like, we can grab a Saturday and we can just come on in here and dunk everybody, whatever, right? He said, no, 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 no. He said, come on a Sunday because it's a celebration and let's do it. He said, because we're family. Like, y'all, I want y'all to understand. Hmm. That just doesn't happen. You know what I mean? Not with leaders. Um, to the place now, it's so much division, you all, and it's so much competition. Um, you don't just have somebody say, come on in. Uh, by the way, um, what, you need this? What do you need? The doors will be open for you. Need a key to get in? People just don't do that, right? So I bless God for his heart. I bless God for all of you being in here and just for the Lord to allow us to come and you all can celebrate this with us. July is an amazing month, you all. Listen, this is going to be Christmas. It is Christmas in July. I want you all to get excited about that. God is doing and he's already moving. I don't want you to look for the shift. The shift has already happened. Hallelujah. I'm telling you that the gifting will be his wisdom, his knowledge, and his understanding. Y'all, if you just seek him first and run after his righteousness, I know the money and the cars and the new house, I know getting out of debt, but guess what? That's what's going to be added. It's already added. I posted the other day, listen, Abraham, be careful. OK, because Abraham had to understand what God had already promised him. He allowed his wife to talk him out of what God had already told him. Watch this, you all. I want you to not just settle for the offer. 
I want you to get excited for the promise. Don't, don't miss that, okay? Because uh, Ishmael was born first because Sarah told Abraham to do that, not God. So Ishmael was a blessing, but Isaac, Isaac was the promise. Look for the promise in July. Come on, Chris, come on. You sure you die? Man, praise God, praise God. And we talked about that last week. We're in our series called Build, our Li Build Your Life, and we talked about that very thing last week and how Abraham had his eyes set on the promise, right? And he learned that he had to trust God, amen. And, and so he leaned into what God said, and he got his eyes fixed on the right things, amen. Man, God is good. He's faithful. I want to just take a few minutes today, and I've got, I've got a lot of scripture that I'm going to give you, and I'm just going to... I'm just going to get, lay out the scripture. I'm going to see where the Lord takes us in this today. And then we're going to get up out of here. And when the Lord says we're done, we're going to be done. And we want to trust that he'll just do a mighty work in our hearts and lives. We are living, Lord, I believe, as the body of Christ in exciting times. For the world, it's perilous times. For the body of Christ, it's exciting times. Right? Right? One passage says, hey, uh, wake up, now it's time to wake up because your redemption is nearer than when you first believed. I believe the Apostle Paul and I believe the Apostles wrote with an expectation of the return of Christ at any moment. And yet we say, like, that was written thousands of years ago, but Peter reminded us thousands of years ago that a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. So don't get concerned about what God has promised in his word, and don't be lax concerning his promises, because God will bring every promise to pass. And so what, what, what they spoke about then, though it was many years ago, we're living in it today, amen? And I'm reminded of another passage that says, they long to look at what you're seeing right now. The writer was writing in context about the day in which they lived. The, the writers of the Old Testament long to see what you're seeing. And I believe the writers of the New Testament long to see what we are experiencing today. Because I believe we're living in the day that God is beginning to pour out His Spirit upon all flesh. Amen. I believe sons and daughters will begin to prophesy. Come on, somebody. I believe God is getting ready to raise up a, a, a people that are passionate and hungry and desire to see the Lord magnified, lifted up, and exalted. Amen. Hallelujah. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. When we begin to put Jesus first, then we're going to see things begin to happen. Amen. Hallelujah. It's time to return to the place from where we've fallen. Come on, somebody. Amen. And so we need to build our life on the hope, amen? Lead us, Lord, to the rock that is higher than us, Lord. And a couple of weeks ago, Donzel kicked off this, this series with the, with the question or the idea of, of choosing between two letters, two small letters, E and I. Either you're going to be bitter or you're going to be better, amen? There's a difference between the I and the a big difference. There's a great chasm between the I and the E, but you are at a crossroads. Either you're going to let your life be bitter, allow it to be bitter by the circumstances and cares of this world, or you're going to lean into what God has, not trust your own understanding, acknowledge Him in all your ways, and watch Him make your life better. Amen. <coughs> Hallelujah. Last week we talked about the difference between the spiritual and the carnal. Amen. And we have a lot of carnality in the church. It's just a reality. It's the truth. And we can't stop dancing around these ideas and these things and these being worried about offending other people. If we're trying to offend people just to offend people, then our spirit is wrong. But if we're speaking the truth in love, we're going to talk about that, then we ought not be worried or concerned about what we say if we're doing it and motivated by love. If I really love somebody and I know their life is heading in a direction that's going to destroy them, I'm going to go do everything I can to set up roadblocks to stop them. I'm going to go after them. But if I just say, well, it's their choice. I love them. I'm going to let them make their own decision. That's not love. That really isn't love. That's, that's complacency. You know, that's, 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 that's uh, indifference. Amen. There's a difference between love and indifference. Amen. And so, man, we need to not be indifferent today in this hour in which we live and not be afraid to speak the truth in love. God is good. Amen. I want to give you some scripture. So I want to talk about this one particular building block, and I want to tie it into Two things together that we need to live the abundant, successful life that God has for us, and to be and to be uh, to be um, 
to thrive in the days in which we live. And these building blocks that we're going to talk about, this one in particular, it starts with this one, is so vitally important in today's culture. And that's the building block of truth. Truth is not a concept. Truth is not uh, uh, subjective. Truth is not uh, relevant to whatever you're going through in your moment. No, truth is objective. It's solid. It's firm. It's fixed. Why? Because God is truth. Right? Truth is, that's just what truth is. And we're going to look at this. Uh, Proverbs 23, 23. I want to start with this verse. And I thought about this verse. The Bible says, buy truth and do not sell it. By wisdom, instruction, and understanding. He says, you've got to get a hold of the truth. In another place, he says, in all you're getting, get wisdom, right? Because in wisdom is truth, right? Truth, uh, God desires that we know, have, and live by truth. Truth in the definition, in the scripture, in that word, in its context, really, literally means conformity to reality or actuality. To buy truth is to conform to the reality of who God is. I just sent someone a text, and God put it on my heart to send someone a text. And I said, don't miss your opportunity to get to know who God really is, right? Because people have an idea of who they think God is, but there is a truth of who God is. The reality of who God is, is this is a real thing, and we need to know who God is. And so truth is conforming to reality or actuality. And watch this, often with the implication of dependability. When we can know the truth, then we can depend on the truth, amen? Because the truth is faithful every single day. I'm, I, I'm not talking about foot, uh, truth as a concept or a philosophy or an idea. Truth is a person. We're going to see that in a minute. Yeah. Hallelujah. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth. And the life, truth is a person. Psalms 15, 22. And I'll tell you, there is many verses about truth in the scripture. You can do a word study and you'll find a, a plethora. Is that, is that the right way of saying that? A plethora. He'll believe I'll not use big words like that because we mess them up usually. But a plethora uh, of, of, of scriptures that teach and instruct us about truth. Because truth is eternal and fixed. Truth was in the beginning, amen? Jesus was full of grace and truth, amen. You're going to get it here in just a minute, amen. We're going to go somewhere. I believe we're going to go somewhere. You pray for me that I can lead us somewhere today, or that the Lord will lead me to lead us somewhere. All right, uh, Psalms 15, 2. He who walks blamelessly and does what is right speaks truth in his heart. Truth is a heart issue, Right? God desires that truth be in the core of our heart because God needs to be in the center of all, of, all things and God is truth. Okay, let me keep on going. Psalms 51, 6. Watch this. Behold, you delight in truth. The Lord delights in truth. David's writing this psalm and he's writing it after he had been caught, after his sin had been exposed with Bathsheba. You know that David had had this, this, this moment of moral, moral, moral failure in his life. David was the king of the nation of Israel. David had led the people. He was a man after God's own heart. But then he wasn't careful. He became complacent and comfortable. There's something to be said about comfortability and complacency. When we are not willing to be drawn out of our comfort zone and we want to lay and linger in that comfortable, comfortable place, we set ourselves up for the enemy to work, amen, and for the flesh, hallelujah, to take reign in our lives. And so David was in a place of complacency when it was in the season when kings go out to war. Last week I said something. I want to re restate this. This is what the Bible teaches us, that we are not striving to earn salvation. We receive that by grace through faith. But we are in a struggle Ver, the spirit versus the flesh, and it's a real struggle. And when we become complacent and we become uh, uh, lax, we are going to be taken over. We are going to be uh, prone or vulnerable to defeat in our life. And so David, when he was supposed to go out in battle, he was sitting at home taking his ease, and he got caught up, and, and, and he saw something he shouldn't have been looking at. And he was, he was peering over the, the lattice when he should have been on the battlefield looking in the enemy's eye. Amen. And so he was looking to his neighbor's vineyard instead of keeping his eyes on his own house. Amen. And let me tell you something. There's something to be said about that. We need to keep our eyes fixed on, uh, on what God is doing in our life and not worry about what everybody else is doing. Amen. 
Hallelujah. God going to do for everybody else what he wants to do in their lives, but we need to be, take responsibility for ourselves. And so David, he gets caught up in this, and he has this adulterous affair with Bathsheba, and she becomes pregnant, and then now David is on cover-up mode because he doesn't want to be exposed because of the shame and the guilt of his sin, and so he does a horrible thing. He plots the death of the husband of Bathsheba, and once he's dead, he takes her as his wife and brings her in his home, and he lives with this secret for a, oh, oh, almost a year. Because it's not after the baby is born, the baby's dead, the baby dies. But before the baby dies, God comes to David. So months had transpired, and he's living in this sin. And he's suppressing the truth that he knows to be true. But God, in his compassion and mercy, let me tell you something. When God calls you out, it's not because he hates you or he's trying to beat you down or trying to oppress you. He calls you out because he loves you. I used to tell my kids all the time, let me tell you something. Be, be sure your sins find you out. When mama and daddy find out what's going on, it's because God reveals it to us because he loves you and he doesn't want your life to be destroyed. You might have to face shame. You might have to face the, the responsibility of what you did, but that's okay. There's grace and there's mercy in that if you'll just lean in to what God desires to do. And so Nathan the prophet comes to David and he lays it out. He says, David, you're the man. And David owns it. And then David writes this psalm. And, he's, and one of the things he says in this psalm, he says, behold, you delight in truth in the inward being and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Right before that or right after that, he says, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. We can't have a renewed spirit if we're not willing to address truth, amen, and they'll embrace truth. We can't have true freedom unless we're willing to embrace truth. Truth, amen. I've got, a, I've got something I think the Holy Spirit dropped in my spirit. I don't want to get ahead of myself. Let me just keep on going. Let's build to that in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Just a minute, let me read us a few more uh, passages in the Old Testament. Psalms 25, 4 through 5. Make me know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your path. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you, for I wait for you all the day long. Make me know your ways. Teach me your path. Lead me in your truth. We need to desire truth because God delights in a heart that desires truth. And so we need to desire truth. God, lead us in your truth. Psalms 86, 11, Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Not only do you need to lead me in your truth, Lord, I need to walk in truth. we got to walk this thing out, brothers and sisters. Amen. Our faith isn't something just to be believed, but it's something to be experienced, and it's something to be walked out. I can talk. Faith without works is dead. I can talk faith all day long, but am I willing to walk faith? Amen. Faith needs to have shoe leather put to the ground. Amen. And get going. Amen. Praise God. Uh, Psalms 119. Watch this. I like this. Watch this. Get a hold of this. Psalms 119, verse 160. The sum of your word and every one of your righteous rules endures forever. The word sum means whole amount. Every letter, punctuation, every from beginning to end, the sum of God's total word is truth. God isn't partly true. Three quarters true, 99.9% .9 true. Don't you love those ads when they're trying to sell you something? They say, this is 99.9% .9 effective. They leave that 0.1% out there so they can come back and say, well, you're just in the 0.1%. Amen. Uh, but God's word is not 99.9%. .9, it's 100% true 100% of the time. Amen. Hallelujah. The sum of your word is true. Hallelujah. Psalms 145, 18. The Lord is near to all who call on him. All who call on him in truth. A lot of folks calling on God, but they're not willing to accept the truth of God's word. And the Lord is near that. Amen. You've got to come in truth to be near to the God of truth. Hallelujah. Praise God. Isaiah 59, 6. Truth is lacking. And he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. The Lord saw it and it displeased him. That there was no justice. We live in an era where truth is lacking. I'm going to tell you something. You're, you're supposed to be able to trust the media, but you can't believe anything the media says. It's a, a lot of it's opinion, but I would say just as much of it's lies. And I'm not making a political statement, but there is blatant lies in the media on a regular basis. We've lived for two through two years of lies. Amen. 
I don't even want to go down that path. Let's, let me just keep on going. But we live in a day where there is a lack of truth. And we are called to be truth bearers. Amen. And so we can't buy into this. We've got to trust God because when there's a lack of truth, if we're not careful, we'll become discouraged by the lack of truth or we'll believe the lies that we're being sold. That's why we need to stay our eyes focused and fixed on Jesus, who is the author of truth. Amen. Who is truth personified. Come on, somebody. Amen. I'm going to jump over to the New Testament. Watch this. This is John 1, 4, 1, verse 14. We know this one. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son of God, the father full of grace and truth. He's full. That means complete. God is not partially true. That's why God is, whatever attribute that defines who God is, it's complete. God is complete love. That's why the Bible says God is love. God's love and his righteousness are equal because God is righteous. He's a whole. He's not compartmentalized. He's not more of one than he is the other. God is perfect. And so when God judges, he judges perfectly. And he judges righteously. And he judges perfectly righteously in love because he's perfectly righteous, perfectly just, and he's perfectly loved. And so God is not divided, and his word is not divided about who he is either. God is who he is. He's complete, whole, full of grace and truth. Amen. Uh, uh, John 1, 17, he goes on to say, For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus. The law was a schoolmaster to reveal to us the truth, true nature of who we are. Amen. That's what the law does. It reveals the true condition of the heart. I was at camp with the little kids, and so they were doing a part of the service, and they were trying to teach the kids about truth. It was one of the, one of the, one of the messages was on truth and how we need to not def, be defined by the culture today. And so the, the, the little gal who's running that is asking the kids, you guys tell me in here something that is true, that you know is true and can't be changed. And these were kids, and precious little babies were saying what they have been taught and been told. But it's not really based upon the reality of truth. Stuff like, I'm perfect just the way that I am. Wow. I'm beautiful just the way that I am. Uh, there's nothing, uh, and th these ideas of, of, of just, and look, I, don't, don't get me wrong. Let me just say what I need to say here. We need to teach our kids and love our kids and show our kids that they need to have a healthy self-esteem yeah. about themselves. But, we are, but what the danger is, is when our, when our three-year-old is a 30-year-old still saying, thinking the same thing, that's problematic. It sets them up for failure. When, you, when the three-year-old uh, draws you something and you put it on the freezer, you say, oh, that's beautiful, that's wonderful. If that 30-year-old comes back 30 years later and has the same kind of uh, technique and has the same art and it's the same exact picture and just 30 years later, you ain't going to say that's beautiful. You're going to say, dude, what are you doing, you know? There needs to be growth and there needs to be something that changes when we need to encounter truth and truth needs to transform us, amen, hallelujah. And so where we start as babes in Christ is not where we ought to finish as mature saints. And truth is key to get us to the place of maturity where we need to go. The Bible says that the heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. Who can know it? Too many of us are going around saying, God knows my heart. My heart is good, ultimately good. People are, are ultimately good. No, they're not. People are wicked and evil. But here's the thing. When we come to God, he makes us good because it's his goodness in us, amen. Amen. But truth dictates that, and truth tells us that. Amen. And so I'm not talking about going home and telling your kid they're ugly. I'm not saying anything like that. I'm saying we need to understand the condition of our heart. And when we're telling people that God just loves them and nothing they do matters, that he'll love them in spite of that, that's dangerous, and we're only setting them up for failure. God desires like a good parent for us to be responsible and to mature and to grow up. Amen. All right. Pray. Let me keep on going. I want to keep on going. Let me keep on going. All right. John 4, 23 through 24. Watch this. But the hour is coming and now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. The word truth here again, conformity to reality and actuality, often with the implication of dependability. 
God is saying if we're really going to worship him, if we're truly going to come to a place of worship in him, it's in spirit and truth. You can't just have spirit without truth. And you can't just have truth without spirit. It's both, amen? The spirit quickens and makes alive. The truth reveals the real reality of the thing, amen? Watch this. Jesus, is, this context of this verse is Jesus having a rela- uh, an encounter with a woman at a well. We all know the verse. The Samaritan woman, she comes to, uh, to the well to draw water, and Jesus meets her there. Now, if you back up just a few uh, verses from this, before Jesus even has this encounter, he was making his way to wherever he was going, but he had to pass through Samaria. The scripture makes it clear that he had to go through Samaria. Why did he have to do? That means because God never does anything uh, unintentionally. Everything that Jesus did in his ministry, I believe, was intentional and on point. And so he had to go through Samaria because there was a little gal who was living in the lie and deception of the world, and her life was being destroyed, and Christ was coming to set her free. And what was the method he was going to use to set her free? What was the what was the Form it. Truth was what was going to be used to set her free. And so when Jesus has this encounter with her, he doesn't come out and say, you're a rotten, horrible sinner. You're a pathetic piece of garbage. You messed up too many times. You just need to get it together. No, that's what everybody else was saying about her. And that's what she was even saying about herself, I think, to some point. No, Jesus said, you know what? Just let's deal with the reality on the ground. This is what's going on in your life, but that reality can change. The devil will tell you your reality will never change, but God says different. Hallelujah. I'm getting ahead of myself, but there's a difference between facts and truth. Facts say this is the reality in the moment, but the truth can change that reality. Amen. Hallelujah. Facts are just pieces. Facts are just pieces of evidence that ultimately should lead to the one truth. Amen. But it's how you determine the facts. If you're going through life's seasons and struggles and you're going through life's difficulties, you would, that's a fact. You're going through that. You're going you're gonna to either determine that either God is good or God is not. The truth is God is good. But if you allow yourself to be taken in by the reality on the ground or the facts that you see in the moment to determine how you see and view God, then your, your truth detector will be skewed and you won't know truth. You'll only know deception. But if you can lean in to understand that beyond the present circumstance, the present reality in the moment, there's a transcendent truth that transcends time and space that's eternal, that I can build my life on. I can set my stakes in the ground on this truth. And I'm going to tell you what, my circumstance is going to change. It changes all the time. The storm doesn't come to stay. It comes to pass. But God's word remains true, faithful, steadfast, constant. And it's something, Brother Bear, that we can build our life on. We can build our life on. Watch this. Jesus didn't coddle the woman at the well. There's a lot of coddling going on in the church. And I'm not talking about being mean to people because I've been around some nasty religious people, legalistic people that were looking for the faults in others. Not because they wanted to help that person but just to ease their own guilt, be conscious. Uh, Jesus makes it plain when the woman was caught in adultery. What did they do? They brought her, they threw her at Jesus' feet with some desire to, tent, to, to catch Jesus in some trap that he might break the law. And what does Jesus say? You with who, who is without sin cast the first stone. And what did they do? One by one. And the Bible says from the oldest to the more mature to the least, the youngest, the more immature to drop the stones. Why? Because before the grace of God stand I. And, that, that, and if I'm looking at somebody speck in their eye, I'm back, I've probably got a massive log in my own eye. See, when we, when we confront, when Jesus confronted the woman at the well, it wasn't to beat her down anymore or to, 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 to ease some kind of, uh, 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 um, you know, whatever, whatever I'm trying to say here. The reality was he loved her and he was willing to go through Samaria to encounter her, to set her free because he loved her enough to do it. Watch this. Truth doesn't condemn. Truth sets free. We're told today to keep our mouth shut and not preach the whole counsel of God's word because we might offend somebody. But the times and days of that are over. It's time that we get back to preaching the whole counsel of God's word. But we need to be motivated by love because people are going to hell. Amen. Hallelujah. So truth doesn't condemn. Truth sets free. Look at John 8, 31 through 32. So Jesus said to the Jews... Um, 
wait a minute, I, I, I wrote that one down. That's the wrong one. I want to give you this verse. I'm going to give you this verse real quick. Right here it is. I got it right here. John 3, 16. Watch this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. So when Jesus spoke truth, it wasn't to condemn. All right? It was to save. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. Truth does not condemn you. Unbelief condemns you. And we, do, we think all the time that if a person is speaking truth, they're just being judgmental. No, truth is designed and set up by the Father to set and liberate people. Not only did Jesus come to liberate the woman at the well, but he created, he, he caused her liberation to become, he caused her in her liberation to become a liberator of others. And so I was lost and dead in my sin, bound to and, and, and destined for a sinner's hell. But when Christ saved me, he liberated me to be a liberator of others. And so when I withhold the truth, I'm not doing what I've been called to do. I've been called to speak the truth but to speak it in love amen hallelujah and so truth doesn't condemn it sets free unbelief condemns amen hallelujah watch this i'm, I'm getting somewhere i'm going somewhere i promise i am jesus said to the jews who had believed him if you abide in my word you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will if you're truly my disciples, you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Jesus desires that we know him in order that we might be set free. And I know Christians that are bound in their mind and their thinking. It's God who gives revelation, not man. Jesus is having a conversation with his disciples, Matthew chapter 16. And he says, who do men... Say that I am. Some say you're Jeremiah the prophet or Elijah or, or, or this one or that one. Some say even John the Baptist. But who do you say that I am? The problem in the Christian world today is we're letting men tell us who God is instead of letting God tell us who he is. We're allowing other men to define God for us instead of having a relationship with the Father and letting him tell us who he is. And what does Jesus say? Who do you say that I am? Peter says, you are the Son of God, the Messiah. You are the anointed one. And what does Jesus say? Peter, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you but my Father in heaven. See, it's ultimately the spirit of truth that reveals who God the Father is, who God the Son is. And that's who we need to be getting our information about truth. Not the world, not those around us, not even preachers, amen. Because preachers are flawed, hallelujah. Ultimately, God desires that each one of us have a relationship with truth and have a relationship with him, amen. Hallelujah. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. There's nothing wrong with looking to men as an example, as long as their example is the example of Christ. If their example is not the example of Christ, you need to be careful. And even if you are following them, be careful. Always look to Jesus, the author and finisher. Don't look to men because men are going to fail you. The apostle Paul was probably the greatest apostle in the New Testament, but he had shortcomings. He got angry. He got mad at times. He had disagreements with people. He wasn't perfect. I believe that's why he wrote uh, 1 Corinthians 13 because he had a realization one day that I don't have it all figured out but there is a greater there is a greater thing and that is love and if I need to that's why Paul talks so much about love because before Paul ever got saved he was a mean rascal he was hateful he 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 mistreated people he enchained people separated families and even condoned the murder of people all the while holding their coats while they stoned Stephen. He had the law. He knew the, the law of God. But he didn't have the spirit of God. I'm, I'm going somewhere. I'm saying that to go somewhere. All right. I'm going somewhere with this. All right. Hallelujah. Let me, where am I at? Daryl, come here. Just help me, man. Just play with me for just a minute. I've got a lot of notes left, but you just play with me. All right. Keep me on track. Squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> Stay focused, Pastor. <laughs> watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Jesus makes three claims about himself before he goes to the cross. Watch this. He says, I am the way, one. I am the truth, 
two. I am the life, three. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's a truth claim. That's a, that's a true statement. That's a statement of factual reality. A lot of people today believe that not to be so. Some who even claim that Jesus was who he is don't even believe that. Some believe that there are many paths that ultimately lead you to God. But Jesus is making a definitive statement by saying, Hey, listen, whosoever will come, it's all inclusive to whoever will choose to come and believe. But if you don't choose to believe, it's exclusive. You can't get in. There's only one door. There's only one way. There's a, and it's a narrow way. It's a hard way. It's not easy. Jesus never said it would be easy. He said in this world you'll have trouble. He never said. He made certain clu- truth claims about himself and about our reality as as Christ followers, the reality, but the true reality is, do we believe it? And will we accept it? Amen. Amen. Praise God. Direction, the path, the way means direction. The line leading to a point. It's not many lines leading to different places or, or a lot of lines coming to one place, but it's one line leading to one place. Hallelujah. Some people think it's the other way around, but it's not. And this is what Jesus said, and he proves it by his resurrection, but we'll just keep on going, all right? Direction is one line leading to one place. The way, the truth, conformity to reality and actuality, often the implication of dependability. And finally, life. It's the condition of living or the state of being alive. Jesus gives life. Nobody who, anybody who is not in Christ is not alive, spiritually, because you can't be without having a relationship with Jesus. You're dead in your trespass and sin, but Christ makes you alive by the Spirit. Praise God. Just because you're playing, though, doesn't mean I'm going to be done. I'm just, I'm just helping you keep me, all right? All right. I might preach another two hours. I don't know. I'm feeling pretty good. Look at this. The woman at the well accepted the truth and was set free. Not only was she set free, but she helped free others. The young rich man comes to Jesus looking for freedom and eternal life. And when he's confronted with the truth, what does he do? He walks away sadly. You can choose to build your life on truth or you can discard truth. You can accept something that claims to be true, but there's only one real truth. Amen. And that truth finds its place in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And so this is what is happening. Truth doesn't condemn. Truth liberates. Truth is fundamental. God speaks truth to Adam. Satan questions truth and lies to Eve, and she is deceived. And here we are today with the condition we have. It's always been about questioning the truth of God. we got a lot of people going around questioning the truth about a lot of things that are in Scripture. And we've got people in the church that are uncomfortable with us having these conversations. And even as a pastor, I've bought into the uncomfortability about speaking the truth in love. Here's the reality. Everything that God said concerning creation from the beginning to the end in Revelation is true. Truth, and it hasn't changed. It won't change. No matter how people feel and no matter what people experience, that won't change the truth of who God is. I had a thought, and I never developed this thought, so I'm just going to kind of lay it out a little bit. But here's the thing. we got to be careful. And I, I was going to do this as a sermon illustration, and I didn't do it. And so maybe I shouldn't do it, but I feel like I need to do it, so I'm going to try to do it. All right. If it doesn't make sense, I'll, maybe I'll come back next week and try to do it again. But you guys remember the story of the three pigs? One built his house out of what? Hay, straw. Another built his house out of, and the last one built his house out of, okay, the wolf came to the guy with the straw, and he did what? No, he didn't. Before he blew the house down, what did he do? He huffed and he puffed, and he blew the house down. The devil does a lot of huffing and puffing, but if you ain't built on the right foundation, and if you ain't got the right material you're building your life on, his huffing and puffing becomes a reality in your life. The man who built his house on sticks, it seemed to be a little bit better material to build your house in. Hallelujah. It seemed to be a better way to to go about it. But guess what happened? The wolf came by. What did he do? He huffed and he puffed. And what happened? The house blew down. Praise be to God. There's grace and mercy when we don't get it right. The little pig in the straw house or the little pig in the stick house got out of there with their, with their skin, amen, by, by, the, by the hair of their skin, whatever that saying is. They barely got out of there alive. But they got to third brother's house. And what was third brother's house made of? Brick, right? Hallelujah. And what did the wolf do? He came back around, right? The devil don't got any new tricks. 
The same thing he did to Eve in the garden is the same thing he's doing to people today. Did God really say? He ain't got no new tricks. But he ain't always successful. He's successful too often, I would say, in a lot of believers' lives, mine included, at times. But thanks be to God, there's grace. Jesus is full of grace and truth. Amen. Is my illustration making sense? Yeah. Hallelujah. Praise God. He huffed and he puffed, but he could not blow the house down. Hallelujah. He couldn't blow it down. Hallelujah. I got some, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta go here. Watch this. This is so good. I gotta do this. I gotta do this. All right. All right. I'm, I'm almost done, I promise. Praise God. Finally, watch this. Go, let's go, go with me to Ephesians chapter 6. There was more to that illustration. It just went out of my mind. And I, I, Lord, let it come back if you want me to have it. All right? Praise God. Hallelujah. What we build our life on matters. And what we use to build our life with matters. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Look at somebody say wrestle. All right? But against the rulers and against the authorities and against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. Take up the proper things you need to build your life on, huh? Hallelujah. I'm not trying to rewrite the scripture. I'm just trying to make it applicable to, to the sermon series. Hallelujah. He's talking about defensive weapons and offensive weapons to fight the enemy and withstand the enemy. But I also believe the man who builds his house upon the rock will be able to weather the storm. It's how you build that matters. Amen. And it's how you dress that matters. Oh, that's another word right there. That's another preacher right there. Let's, I'll leave that one for Don Zell to preach. <laughs> Write that down. How you dress matters. All right, you got that? <laughs> Dress for success. Come on. I, mean, I, want, I want some rights to that message, though. <laughs> so please, you better not take it. I gave it to him, all right? <laughs> Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand against in the evil day. That you may be able to stand in the evil day. In the evil day. He, I think he's speaking of a specific day. Something specifically that's going to take place. I think there are strategic set-up moments that the enemy plans to disrupt your life. He doesn't know the future. He's limited in his, in his ability and in his resources. He's got a lot of resources, but he's limited. But he is strategic, and he's good at what he does. Thousands and thousands of years have made him good at what he does. That's why we've got to be careful. Do all we can do to stand. I want you to go with me to 2 Timothy 4, verse 1 through 5. This is the NLT version. Praise God. You got something good, man? All right. You feeling good about it? All right. Here we go. Solemn, I solemnly urge you in the presence of God in Christ Jesus, who will someday judge the living and the dead when he comes to set up his kingdom. This is Paul talking to Timothy, the preacher. Paul, an older preacher, talking to a younger preacher. And he urges him or he warns him in the presence of God in Christ Jesus who's going to judge the living and the dead when he comes to set up his kingdom. Preach the word of God. Be prepared whether the time is favorable or not. There's always opportunity if we'll just avail ourselves to the Lord. Too often we're looking for a favorable time, and I've done this myself, and we need to be ready to speak the truth no matter if it's comfortable or not. Now watch what he says. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. Another translation says sound doctrine. Now watch what he says. For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound doctrine or sound and wholesome teaching. Sound doctrine means healthy doctrine. True doctrine, right? True doctrine. Hallelujah. Sound doctrine protects you and keeps you and guards you. But there's coming a day when people will not 
take heed to sound doctrine. They won't listen to it. But that doesn't negate my responsibility to speak it and to teach it and to live by it and to build my life on it. Hallelujah, hallelujah. For a time is coming, they will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. You don't like what I got to say? Just go on Facebook. Go on YouTube. Google it. Preacher who says, and you'll find the preacher who will tell you what you want to hear. You pray for me that I'll never pervert the word of God. You pray for me that I'll discern rightly the word of truth and that I'll preach it. You pray for our preachers that we'll never compromise the word of God. Pray, pray for us. Pray for us that we never put ourselves before God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just pray with me right now. Father, Lord, I thank you, Jesus. God, I give you honor and glory today. Thank you, Jesus. We don't want to miss what you're doing, God, in this moment right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. They will follow their own desires, and they will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject, they will reject the truth and chase after myths. But you should keep a clear mind in every situation. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at telling others the good news and fully carry on out the ministry God has given you. He's talking to the young preacher, but I'm telling you every one of us need to take heed and endure sound doctrine. Not allow ourselves to become offended. And not allow ourselves to be afraid to speak the truth. There's a lot of things that we could say that I could even say in the moment that I could challenge our current cultural climate. There are certain things I could point out, and everyone in here probably knows what I'm talking about. I'm just, I'm just telling us as God's people, don't allow our emotions. This is what I was going to say. This would, thank you for that reminder, Holy Ghost. The three little pigs. <laughs> I believe building our life out of, building our house out of straw is like building our life on emotion it can be blown by every wind of doctrine I believe building our house out of strict sticks can be if we're only looking for experience experience without truth is dangerous right because there are there are experiences that we have in life if it doesn't line up with truth you need to discard that experience but when we build our life on truth every single time First and foremost, then our experience are validated, and then we can keep our emotions under control, and our emotions can be invalidated at the right time. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Ghost, for reminding me of that. Lord, help me land this right here. I want to go back. So this is what Paul warns in the last days this would happen, and we're seeing ideas being taught today, and even arguments happening in the church. I talked to a pastor Today, uh, uh, I talked to a pastor on, during the camp who said he had to go, put back, go home and put out fires because there was something that happened in the church where, where, where there was something that, that some, you know, there was a disagreement or argument over things that are going on in the modern culture with the whole gender idea and the whole gender movement. And we got to be careful that we don't bash people because there are people that are really deceived and need the love of Jesus Christ. But we can't compromise God's truth either. And we got to stand on God's truth. And so we need to be, we need to be the catalyst. Here's another example for that. We are having a conversation. Uh, we, we know that the Supreme Court just came down with this decision on Roe v. Wade. But Roe v. Wade doesn't get rid of abortion. It just sends it back to the state. Here's what we ought to be. We ought to always be. And as a church, I'm going to say unapologetically, we are, we are for life unapologetically but let me well, before you clap but let me say something to you but we need to have a plan in place that we can help those that are struggling with the things that they're going through and so whether or not uh, hang on just a second let me don't clap no clap I didn't tell the other people not to clap you don't clap either listen to me there's got to be balance in this right and so we've got to go back to the word of God and so how do we minister to people that are going and dealing with real life issues we've got to do it based upon truth and we've got to be motivated by love to do it and so when we 
face these issues of the day that challenge the scripture and what God has said concerning uh, sexuality, gender, life, uh, relationships between husbands and wives, whatever it may be, lying, greed, gluttony, whatever it may be. We need to approach it from the standpoint, God, I want to know your heart in what your word has said, and I want my life to be defined and built on truth. And so whatever we do and whatever we affirm, we need to do it not only by words but by actions. All right? God is good. God is so good. Now watch this because this is what the enemy wants to do. He wants to divide us. That's why we got to take our stand and be careful. All right? We bought into that lie a few months back. We can't buy into that again. We've got to be built our, build our lives on truth and stand on truth. Hallelujah. Unequivocally. We can't compromise truth. All right, now watch it. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth. Paul gives him a list of pieces of armor to put on. And I just want to close with this. The very first one is truth. And the belt of truth had its place. The belt, the loin, the girding of the loin belt had a purpose. It was not only to, to, to fasten the breastplate of righteousness, but it was also to hang the shield, the sword of the spirit on. And there was also a clip for the, the shield of faith that would actually, you would set the shield of faith on a clip that was on the loin belt of truth. Every part of the armor was held in truth. It begins with truth. Everything that we do as believers has to start with truth. We come to the knowledge of the truth, and then we are set free. And then from there, God takes us on to maturity. I want to read something to you, and I'm going to close with this, all right? All right, watch it. I just want to read this. this was, I thought this was really good. Truth. It's the state of the heart answering to God's truth. Inward practical acknowledgement of the truth as it is in him. The agreement of our convictions with God's revelation. That's what truth is. It's, it's the acknowledgement of who God is. It's a heart thing. Now watch this. He's talking about the loin belt of truth. The loins encircled by the girdle form the central point of the physical system. Hence, in the scripture, the loins are described as the seat of power. To smite through the loins is to strike a fatal blow. To lay affliction upon the loins is to afflict heavily. Here was the point of the junction for the main pieces of the body armor so that the girdle formed the common bond of the whole. Truth gives unity to the different virtues and values and consistency to the character of God and what God wants to do in our life. Truth brings unity to that. And all the virtues are exercised within the sphere of truth. God reveals himself in truth. Jesus said, when the spirit of truth comes, sanctify yourself with truth. You can have all spirit and no word, you're going to blow up. You can have all word and no spirit, you're going to dry up. But somebody said you get the spirit and the word, you're going to grow up and you're going to power up. Amen? And so we need spirit and truth. Amen? Father, in the name of Jesus, God, I love you. I praise your name, God. I ask you right now, Lord. To help us right now in this moment, Lord, as we yield and lean in to what you want to say to us in these next few moments. God, what you want to challenge us with. God, what you desire. God, what is the practical application that you're leading us to grab hold of this morning? And God, I would say for me, Lord, it is to believe your word, to take it at face value, and to begin to live it out. Live out your word when it says how I should treat others. Live out your word and says how I, how I ought to, to seek you and how I ought to approach you, God. Live it out. But I'm asking right now, God, before we move on, Holy Spirit, come in and do a work. Come in and do a work right now. Unite our hearts around truth. Unite our hearts around truth. I'm going to ask them to sing. If you're struggling today with something you know to be true, but yet your emotions is trying to convince you otherwise, I want to encourage you, yield that to Christ today.
If you're struggling with something God has said in his word because of experiences that you've had in your own life, yield those to Christ right now. You just yield it to Christ and come to church and say, Lord, I might not completely feel this and I might not, my experiences may be different, but God, I want to know what's truth. I don't want to be deceived. Lord, help me right now in this moment and humble ourselves and let's just yield ourselves before the God of all truth. Hallelujah. As they lead us in worship, we're going to open the altars. Maybe you're not serving God right now. Maybe you've walked away from God. Maybe you've never committed your life to God. Make today the day that you do that right now. Lord, I pray right now, Lord God, draw sons and daughters, Lord.